My first encounter with a codependent relationship was when I watched the movie When a Man Loves a Woman. And she was an alcoholic and he was the spouse that took care of the alcoholic wife. And since then, I've been surrounded around many codependent relationships, one of them being my own. So in this episode, I want to explore what a codependent relationship is and how to identify when you are in a codependent relationship. Hi, my name is Martika. I'm a plus size fashion and beauty enthusiast, entrepreneur, mother of two beautiful girls, and I've experienced both the good and not so great moments of love. Truth is, you have to. And I want to have an open and fun dialogue about those ups and downs with you. I want this to be a community of healing where we pull each other through, lift each other up, and maybe even get each other out of love's complex moments. Hi guys, welcome back to my podcast. This is episode two. And today we're discussing codependency. And listen, codependency is, it's a tricky one. It's one that I'm still trying to get a full grasp on. Um, And in preparation for this episode, I I did some research um, because... I was curious, like, I feel like I know what codependence is, but I'm not a thousand percent sure. And I'm not, I'm also not sure if that's because I am currently in a codependent relationship and there might be that aspect of it that I am kind of like in denial. So like, this is a real, real episode. So what exactly is codependency? One of the definitions that I've received in terms of codependency in a relationship is where one person enables the self-destructive behavior or dysfunctional behavior of a loved one. And I realize that codependency doesn't only have to exist within a um, relationship, like a romantic relationship, that codependency can also exist in other relationships in your life, whether it's friendships or familial relationships, right? I, for one, just to give you some background, ha- I have a very codependent family. Like I am, I'm very codependent on my, I was very codependent on my family for some time. Um, I always had like that cushion, always where I knew that I could fall with no problem and that they would always be there either to pick me up or to like, you know, give me that pat on the back to be like, everything's okay. As I got older, I realized that that codependence on my family was actually destructive because I was, I was engaging in destructive behavior and no one was stopping me because people were just like enabling me. So here's why codependency for me is one of those situations where it's like I understand and I'm almost certain that I have witnessed witnessed it all of my life is that I did not have a term for what was happening. And it would make sense that I, for one, was in a codependent relationship because my parents are in a codependent relationship. How this came about, of, of course, as usual, I was talking to my girlfriend and we were talking about relationships and we were talking about how like cute it is also to see like two, you see that older couple and you're like, oh my God, they're so cute. And I want to, you know, I, I want to be that when I, when, when I get that old and I want to have someone there and there's the beautiful part of that. And it'd be great if that couple is with each other independent of one another and that they are not coddling each other in their dysfunction. But the relationships that we have seen growing up is that these couples that are together are usually coddling each other's dysfunction. So in that case, it's not so cute. So for me personally, you know, I saw my mother coddling my dad's dysfunction. My dad was an alcoholic. He's still with us, um, but... <laughs> But he was, thank God, an alcoholic. And I saw that growing up. And I remember very vividly watching 
my mother coddle him. She would make sure that his meal was ready when he arrived at whatever time in the middle of the night. And he, she made sure that his meal was warm and that he had something to eat, that she was able to take his clothing off and put him in, you know, the shower to make sure he didn't drown in his own vomit. Like, and as a young child, I must have been no more than five ish, six. Like, I remember seeing that. And it's very vivid in my mind. I remember being even the person to be to tell my dad, like, oh, you know, like, why are you doing this? I was very young. I had no idea what I was talking about. But I remember like yelling at my dad because I was channeling whatever my mother was feeling. So I was defending her and defending our our home. And why are you doing this? And you shouldn't be doing that. And I was a little too young to even be having these discussions with my parents. But this is to say that I witnessed this codependence at a very young age. And some of my friends have witnessed this type of codependence at a very young age. I mean, we're talking about parents that, you know, have either had some sort of addiction together or um, a the relationship who one person is solely dependent on another person's income. And it was just interesting to me, I guess, and now where I'm having like this revelation, like, oh my God, I know what, I kind of know what codependence is. And I think I've witnessed codependence all my life, but it's not what I thought it was. It's not actually a good thing. People who struggle with codependency usually have a tendency to overextend themselves to their own detriment as well. So while Andy Garcia, for example, while he was taking care of his wife, he was also neglecting his own wants and needs, even though his wife was in a legitimate issue, like she had a legitimate, a legitimate problem. And so by no means am I saying, oh, well, he should have just dumped her. You know, he got into that relationship, he's married, you know, he has a certain responsibility for his wife. However, in this case, the dysfunction was so serious that in him taking care of her, it was a detriment to himself. And so when we're talking about codependency and codependent relationships is not only codependent on the people suffering because they are not they are being enabled, but the people who are enabling the codependency are suffering as well because their wants and needs are not being met. So, you know, again, like I feel like I have a grasp on the issue and the the idea of what codependency is, but I want it to like nail down, like how does it relate to like, let's say our culture, right? To my environment and how I can truly and fully understand what codependency is and that it wasn't just this arbitrary term. So now that we know what codependency is, we want to know what does it actually look like, though, right? Like, what does it look like? I gave you some examples, but those are just my personal examples and an example of a movie. What are what's a broader definition or what are broader signs and symptoms of codependency? And one of those symptoms is low self-esteem. Right. Familial dysfunction, which is what I was talking about earlier. Right. Where the family enables the behavior of a child or a husband or a wife. Depression. Right. Anxiety. Stress. Obviously. Right. You're enabling an alcoholic, let's just say, in this case. And what why I chose that example is because it's one of the common examples to kind of give you a clear picture of what codependency looks like, um, which is like the alcoholic spouse and the enabling spouse, right? Um, So the stress that is caused with that and low emotional clarity. So for on the other side of like a very emotional person is someone that is completely disconnected, let's just say. Some other signs of codependency are you know, an intense feel, an intense need to feel liked, 
So I would argue that today's society is very codependent on what other people have to say, especially when we are on social media and we are basing our purpose and our value on a number of likes, right? So as a society nowadays, we are very codependent on one another because this is how we are validated as human beings, whether or not, and obviously this is not everyone, but this is a good portion of our youth, let's just say, and even some of, you know, other people that are just validated by this idea that, oh, if I have X amount of followers, if I have X amount of likes, then I am clearly have value. I clearly have purpose. Um, you have another one is a, you have a difficulty saying no. Right. Um, I'm a Libra, so I know a lot about that. I don't I mean, actually. Yeah, I say no really quickly, like it, especially if you but but if I am in that relationship, then yes, no, I have a difficult I have difficulty saying no if I am in that space. But outside of that, then I have no issues. <clears throat> You have a compulsion to take care of others or you have poor boundaries and some intimacy issues. You're confused, love and pity. That's a big one. You have fear of abandonment or fear of being alone. Let's just say there's some people that cannot operate unless they are in a relationship. They don't like being alone. Um, Another one is a need to control over loved ones, to control loved ones. That's one. So those are some of the signs and symptoms of codependency. And how is it that we can recognize whether or not we are in a codependent relationship? Right. But how do you know, like, am I in a codependent relationship? Like if you're wondering to yourself, well, Am I in this relationship? Here are some of the questions that I've seen that point to or give you a guide as to whether or not you are in a codependent relationship if you are kind of uncertain as to whether you are in one. Uh, And I'll just pick a few. So one of them is, it is difficult to say no when your partner makes demands on your time and your energy. I'll say it again. It is difficult to say no when your partner makes demands on your time and your energy. And that's big because your time and your energy is very important. And if your time is being occupied and your energy is being expended, then you have no time or energy for yourself. So you see where I'm going with this? If you are the enabler, then you are suffering because your time and your energy are being expended and you have difficulty saying no to your partner for whatever that reason is. One of the things that I haven't discussed is that the person that is enabling usually finds some sort of validation from this, right? They feel validated. Oh, my husband needs me because, or my partner needs me because, you know, he cannot survive or she cannot survive without me because they are an alcoholic. And it's that idea that I am needed so badly that gives me validation because I have, let's just say, low self-esteem or I suffer from depression or I've in the past had familial dysfunction or stress, right? So all of those signs that present in myself are the reasons why I am enabling another person and I'm finding validation in myself by enabling that person because I feel wanted and needed. Do I make excuses for my partner in terms of drugs, alcohol, or the law, right? If you have a partner that is constantly um, in and out of jail, let's just say, or that is constantly or that has a drug problem, or that has an alcoholism issue, am I making excuses for that person, right? Am I just 
brushing it off like, oh, you know, he's just had a bad day at work, but he has a bad day at work, he or she. I have to make sure not to say he constantly because I'm talking from a woman's perspective, obviously, but this this can um this can happen in any relationship, right? Um but you know, is my partner making excuses for having a drug issue or having an alcoholism issue? And am I making excuses excuses for my partner and then saying that he's he or she is having a bad day? My partner's having a bad day and that's the reason why they decided to come home and have a drink or have five drinks or after the drink, you know, it leads to an altercation and it doesn't have to be a violent one, but let's just say now the excuse that you're making is that my partner got into, he, he or she, or they would not do that if they hadn't been drinking. Right. So these are kind of like the excuses that you might make for a partner. If you are in a codependent relationship, um, are you constantly worried about the other person's opinion of who you are? Like I encountered this a whole lot and this, especially like as a, as a woman, like there are certain gender roles that we are supposed to occupy or that it was intended for us to occupy at some point, you know, our society is really like shifting and changing. So gender roles are kind of, are, they're still very much there, but they are, it is shifting. Right. But I remember like, you know, there are certain things that you are not supposed to, you weren't supposed to do in front of your significant other, especially as a woman, like, you know, like belching or, you know, in some cases, like looking a certain way or I like you need, if my spouse comes home, I must have my hair done. And, you know, I must have at least have a nice negligee on. I can't just be my true authentic self you know so are you constantly worried about what the other person is saying about you or thinking about you or their opinion of you and does it worry you that you think that your partner believes that you have poor eating habits and are your eating habits changed because you believe that your partner does not approve of your eating habits is that a codependent relationship right Do you feel trapped in your relationship? Do you keep quiet to avoid arguments? Do you make extreme sacrifices in your own life in order to satisfy your partner's needs? Right? And these are all questions that I'm literally verbatim reading off of a site um, for a mental health, a mental health site and where they talk about codependency. Right? So these are some of the questions that you can ask yourself and to identify whether or not you are in a codependent relationship. And I know for me, when I read some of these questions, I was like, wow, like, yeah. I mean, I think we've all been there where you're just like, I don't want to go through this. Last week, we talked about uh, communication, right? And where one partner kind of just checks out. And then there's a flip side of that where the other partner is like, you know what? I don't even want to have this argument. It's too much on my energy. It's draining too much of my energy to continue to have this conversation. So I'm just going to keep quiet. I'm just going to be quiet because I don't want to have this argument. And then there are other times where you're like, you know what? No, like we're going to go toe to toe today because I'm fed up and I'm tired. But is that a codependent relationship? Are you in a codependent relationship because you choose to not speak up for your own morals and values and opinions because you want to avoid an argument, right? So these are some of the signs that you may or may not be in a codependent relationship and definitely questions that can help you understand how um, to tell if you are in a relationship, in a codependent relationship. Now, I am not a psychologist, so I'm not going to go into what causes codependency, although, you know, I think I touched upon that earlier on in the episode where I think most of the issues that we encounter as adults probably come from some sort of exposure from when we were younger, right? It's either something that we were exposed to as very small children, um, 
or something that we've been exposed to based off our environment, right? Because some things we are exposed to regardless of whether or not in the home we have like great familial relationships. Some things are just, uh, we are byproducts of our environment, right? So I think... I think we can acknowledge that your childhood has a great impact on how you carry out your relationships later on in life. And then you go through this process where you kind of reevaluate what your childhood was and you make changes accordingly. Right. So I don't want to really go into what causes codependency, but. I do want to talk about some of the things that you can do in order to help either remove yourself from a codependent situation or at least get the help that you and your partner need in order to to overcome your codependency. But before we get into that, I want to talk to you about how I chose to launch my podcast. And I don't know if you remember in the last episode, I talked about how I'd been wanting to launch my podcast for about a year or so. And I've been contemplating it and I did my research and I finally landed upon a platform that I thought would be able to help me in the best way possible. And I knew that I didn't probably have all the technical abilities in order to launch my podcast the way that I wanted to, but Buzzsprout made it so easy for me to do. Within minutes, I was able to have my podcast disseminated to many different directories like Apple, Spotify, Google. I got a great looking podcast website. I had audio players that I could drop into my website as well. And I got detailed analytics to see how people are listening and the tools to promote my episodes and so much more. Once I realized that podcasting didn't seem so hard when I knew that I had the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. After I launched my podcast, I got emails to reassure that I was on the right path and they gave me all the tools that I needed to market my podcast in the best way possible. So if you're contemplating starting a podcast, just grab whatever gear you have, sit in a quiet space and join over 100,000 podcasters who are already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. So if you're thinking about starting your podcast, follow the link in the show notes and let Buzzsprout know that I sent you. You'll get a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan. And of course, it helps support the show. We've talked about what codependency is and we've talked about some of the signs and symptoms of codependency. But how do you overcome codependency? Is it is it something that you are either going to live with in your relationship or is it something that you are going to overcome? What I have found in my research and what I said last week, which was actually funny because it was one of the last points that I used, which is psychotherapy. Get the therapy. And the reason why psychotherapy is one of the number one reasons, uh, the number one treatments for codependency is because you need to delve into the dysfunction that you were exposed to in your childhood. So, and emotions that you might've been exposed to in your childhood that are deeply rooted in your behavior now. So something like, um, anger, shame, having grown up with a, in a dysfunctional family where you feel like your parents were either enablers or poor caretakers, you know, having those emotions and those emotions build up over time and unbeknownst to you, whether or not you believe that you've been holding on or resenting um, the people in your life or they end up carrying into your next relationship unbeknownst to you, which is why getting psychotherapy is important because you get to analyze these emotions, identify what they are, identify where they came from and move on from them, right? Find the closure that you need or um, restructure the way that you think or change the perspective, right? So for me, for example, I was always very upset with my mother for, I feel like not, I believe my mother is a massive enabler. She enabled me all of my life, a great portion of my adulthood, right? But 
I had to come to a point where instead of resenting her for having done that and, you know, holding her accountable for some of the decisions that I made in my adult life, right? Because I'm still an adult, like I can make better decisions, but we make our decisions based off of how we were raised, right? So instead of resenting her and to kind of um, patch up our relationship in a way, right? Because I still struggle with this, but to kind of patch my relationship up with my mother in a way I had to take, take, I had to acknowledge that she well, herself was in a relationship, what her childhood looked like and how she talked about her childhood and how she talked about the dysfunction of her mother and her father and her stepfather and how that influenced how she raised me and how she raised me influenced how then, you know, I raise my child, for example. So it's like a chain effect. And I had to stop and think and like really acknowledge and analyze what this behavior was. And it's not easy because the first thing I want to say is no, but it was your responsibility as a parent, right? But in order to get those, uh, that resentment in order to not resent my my parents as much, I needed to understand their circumstances, right? Now, now I had to understand their marriage. I had to understand their uh, circumstances as immigrants coming here. I had to understand all of that in order to dissolve myself of these resentful emotions. Because otherwise I wouldn't be able to continue a relationship with my parents if I felt like they were the sole reason why part of why most of my life is the way that it is right so receiving psychotherapy can be very can be very helpful in terms of codependency and acknowledging some of those feelings those deeply rooted feelings of hurt and loss and anger and that in turn allows you to restructure your feelings and restructure your thoughts around relationships. So psychotherapy is one of the number one treatments. I'm just going to leave this in here because I don't know if you've never watched one of my YouTube videos and keep in mind, yes, I do. You know, this is love and makeup. So if you never watch one of my YouTube videos, I want you to go and watch one of my YouTube videos and watch one of the short ones. Because when I first started, I did like 20 minute videos and then I, I moved on to like 15 minute videos. And I guarantee you every single video you have, there is like this background noise and it's always some vehicle with a loud, loud engine passing by. And I feel like it's a trademark of all of my videos. So it's funny that now that I'm recording this podcast, this is outside of my home, right? Um, this is like where I record uh, my YouTube videos and things of that nature. So I'm recording here and show, lo, and, lo and behold, you get the um, the loud sound in the background. So I'm just going to leave that in there. <laughs> so these are sounds from the BX. Um, okay. So yeah, so psychotherapy, get some psychotherapy, get some therapy, y'all get some therapy. I mean, it is, it is literally the salvation, <laughs> the salvation that we need for anything, for relationships, for self-esteem, for, you know, familial relationships, for understanding this society, for understanding work relationships, like, you know, get a therapist, obviously, and all research your therapist and, Get a therapist that understands the dynamics of your relationship, like I said last episode, and also that really understands your culture. I think that that's also important. You want a therapist that, you know, it's all fine and dandy to understand the terms, but I think you also need an added advantage, which is to understand the culture. Um, because when you don't understand the culture, it is very hard for you to fix the problem, you know, just like our policing, like I digress because I can go into that policing thing hard body, right? right? But you know, like you need to be culturally sensitive. And I think that therapy is one of those, um, is one of those areas where you need to be culturally sensitive in order to really dissect 
what is going on and the mental health of the individual that you are servicing. One of the other treatments is reading self-help books and about codependency. And I remember a few years back, I mean, this might have been like six years back or something to that effect. My good friend gave me a book about codependency named Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. B-A-T-T-I-E. And it was the number one New York Times bestseller. So it's a great reference book. It talks about codependent char- characteristics. Woo. That's when the Spanish come out. Caracteritica. I could say it's fine in Spanish. <laughs> but um, so like repression, obsession, low self-esteem, controlling, denial, weak boundaries, poor communication, right? Codependence usually, poor communication. What we talked about last week, right? Codependence usually blame or threaten, of course, beg, bribe, advise, Don't say what they mean. Don't mean what they say. Don't know what they mean, right? So we talked about some of those things last week in terms of communication. And, you know, going into this week, now we have that these are some of the characteristics of people that are codependent. So you might want to check out that book. I know I am going to be taking that book with me and I am going to reread it. And also talking with a trusted friend and family members about codependent relationships, which is, again, how we arrived at this podcast, which might be a little lengthy. But I was talking to my friend about codependency. And if I didn't have my friends, I don't know what I would do. My friends specifically are um, very helpful and like, you know, getting me off that ledge like, girl, don't do it. You know, (laughs) when you're just like, I'm done. And, uh, and, and they're there, they're there to help me like dissect and rationalize some of the information because we can sometimes just go to the point of being straight irrational when it comes to our relationships sometimes. So talking to a trusted friend and keyword here is trusted friend. Don't talk to that girlfriend that's going to talk ish about your back behind your back. Don't talk to her. Don't talk to him. Don't talk to they. Don't talk to that person. You know who that trusted friend is or that trusted family member is. Do not talk to a person that will tell you, um, oh, well, if you go back to that relationship, I will never talk to you again. Or don't come and talk to me about it later. Then that's not a trusted friend, in my opinion. That's not a person that you can trust with your relationship. That is somebody that is judging your relationship. And you don't need that. You don't need that because you are you are already in the struggle. So you don't need somebody that's going to sit there and judge your relationship for what it is. And I've been that person. Trust me. I have been the person that has judged another person for their relationship. And I have been the recipient of people judging my relationship. So, you know, acknowledge who you are. Change it if you wish, you know, and know who to trust with your um, with your relationships. And it's very little it's a very small group of people that I trust with my relationship right now. You know, you know, as you get older, you kind of be like, you go from 89,000 friends to five. You can count them in one hand. So those are the people that I can trust in my relationship with, you know, that I, I feel comfortable talking about. And then there are some things that honestly, even till this day, I don't feel comfortable talking to my friends about because there is that idea that, oh my God, you know, they're going to judge me for what's happening in my relationship right now, you know, and then that's a whole other discussion. How do you know when you are finally starting to overcome codependency? How are you recovering from codependency? And psychology today says that you're, you nurture your own wants and desires and develop a connection to your inner world. You see yourself as a self-reliant, smart, and capable. So higher self-esteem, right? So you go from a characteristic of low self-esteem to high self-esteem. Work on yourself, get that build up that self-esteem, you're starting to recover from codependency. You say goodbye to abusive behavior and you are aware of it, you change it, you grow as necessary, right? For your partner to overcome 
uh, for you and for your partner to go overcome unhealthy relationship habits. So if you, so what that means is if you know that you are in a codependent relationship, you first have to acknowledge it. You need to change it. Right. And then you need to find a healthy way to deal in that situation. If you are an, an enabler, you acknowledge that you are an enabler and you stop enabling. If you are the person receiving the care, you acknowledge that you are being enabled and you stop it. Right. And you become more self-aware because you don't have to operate within each other once you have more self-awareness. And for me personally, one of the things that I battled with was that self-awareness. I remember going to therapy a few years back and my therapist saying to me, do you feel like you know who you are? Right. And it was because I was operating based off of what everyone else thought about me because I was I'm very codependent, codependent on my relationships, even my friendships. Right. Very codependent. So I didn't know whether I liked it or whether it was that I liked it because my friends liked it, you know. So it's just that simple that even just acknowledging it and being aware of it is a path to recovery. Lastly, um, and I'm sure there are more, and again, something like a book like Codependent No More, or you, you and your psychotherapist can talk about this, but you respond rather than react to your partner or to a situation, right? Um, less defensive. So if someone says something about you and you don't like it, you become less defensive. You agree to disagree, right? And you know, sometimes they're stuck in what other people are saying. The reason why you may be getting so defensive is because there is some truth to what the person is saying and taking a moment to stop and think, hmm, why is this bothering me so much? Because if you didn't really care or if it mattered nothing to you and if it had no personal connection to you, you wouldn't care. It wouldn't even you. There's no part of you that had would have registered what was going on. You'd just be like, okay, well, that's an opinion. And, you know, opinions are like, you know what, right? So <laughs> so when you start to feel something and you start to like that hot feeling that you get when someone says something and you're like, wait, 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 wait a minute, what? Stop yourself right before you start to react, right? Uh, and just be like, okay, I'm acknowledging it. And then take a moment and then respond to what that person is saying and also not taking stock in that how other people other people's opinions of you make you one way or another you know people's opinions are just people's opinions and what they say about you doesn't make you a good or a a good person or a bad person that those are just opinions <laughs> Your self-esteem is a good indicator of how you are responding to your codependency treatment. The more stock you take in what other people are saying, the more chances are that you are still codependent. But the less stock that you take on what other people are saying, and when I say take stock, it's not like, oh, well, I'm not going to listen to what anyone else is saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you can take criticism, right? That because someone says something about you, it doesn't make it true, right? And that you don't internalize what the people are saying one way or another. So that means if they're like, I got 50 likes on this one picture, or I have 5,000 likes on this one picture, great. I got 5,000 likes on one picture. And it's just that. It is just what it is that you realize that it's either the algorithm or you had great content or whatever the case may be, but you don't feel like, oh, I'm the bomb. Don't, you know, like I don't feel grandiose because I got 5,000 likes on a picture, right? Or if you're a partner, you know, says something about you or 
your partner exhibits some sort of behavior that you feel um, is is thinking negatively of you, right? That that doesn't impact you in any way, that you realize that your partner is an individual and that they're allowed to have their own emotions and that they're allowed to have their own opinions about who you are as a person and that you shouldn't feel bad as a person because your partner has these feelings, right? So the last one also is just say no, say no and accepting no and hearing no, right? Because one of the characteristics of someone that is codependent is that they have a very difficult time saying no, say no, say no. It's fun. I'm telling y'all it's fun to say no, you know, and I struggle with this. I still struggle with this. I really do. You know, um, so just say no. And it's liberating because you have no and say a clear no, because I used to do this and I I still catch myself doing this often is you say a no with an explanation. No is no. No is no. You don't necessarily have to explain yourself. And when you are not in a codependent relationship, I mean, I'm even talking about friendships. They will the other person will call you for it they'll be like "Uh, okay no okay great like and when you start explaining yourself they'll be like girl you don't have to explain yourself to me that is not a codependent relationship right you don't have to explain yourself to me no is a no and that's it you're entitled to say no and same for you if you accept the no you don't accept the no with an explanation oh well why well why can't you do this oh why well why you just accept the no Get comfortable with hearing no and saying no. Now, remember, this is love and makeup. So, of course, I'm going to have to talk to you about makeup and I am delighted to do so. And especially this week, because on the 13th of this month, Pat McGrath, with which if you do not know who Pat McGrath is, find out. Find out who Pat McGrath is. She is a renowned makeup artist. If you don't know who Pat McGrath is, please go to your computer right now. I'll give you a few seconds to do so. (laughs) Okay, so now that you know who Mother is, she's Mother. She is Queen Pat McGrath. She will be launching the Rise of Skywalker collection in collaboration with the new Star Wars movie. And it is dropping it is launching on december 12th of this month and i think this is so awesome she i mean if you take a look at it it's just amazing she has um a few balms a few lip products so i see four lip products so far there's like some nudes there's like an intergalactic white there is a flesh toned one And there is another nude looking one named Gold Astral. It's amazing. And the casing, you know, the iconic Pat McGrath casing is the lips at the almost at the base of the tube. But the outside packaging is like phenomenal. Each package for the lips has a different character of the Star Wars movie. Um. (laughs) R2D2. Oh my god, it's just it's just amazing. She's also going to be releasing in this collection the Galactic Gold Palette. So three palettes. One of them is a Galactic Gold Palette. It's gonna be six shimmer shades. Shimmer shade six shimmer shades. Say that three times. Uh Dark Galaxy palette, which is going to be five shimmer shades and one uh matte shade. It's very cute. It has like deep purples in it. And a crimson color. And then there's the Mothership for Decadence palette, which has the most um the most shades, which in this one is 10, 10 pots. And um they're mostly uh, they're all shimmer. They all look like they're shimmer. And then the last palette, which is the Mothership for Decadence palette, which has 10 shimmer colors. So the price is if we if you know who Pat McGrath is. You know, her her price point is pretty up there. 
Um, so, and obviously just like with anything else, this is going to be pretty pricey. Usually her lipsticks run uh, somewhere between uh, like $38, I believe. And then the the palettes they run you they run you like a buck 50 so yeah this is pretty expensive but if you are a star wars fan or if you enjoy star wars and you enjoy yourself some pat mcgrath i think this is a collection definitely worth getting it is definitely a great holiday gift for someone that loves star wars even if they're not into makeup i swear just having anything star wars is worth is worth having especially yeah and if you're into makeup, forget it. This is really good. I am excited to try the nudes and the flesh tone lipsticks. Um, uh, lip balm, excuse me. I Hopefully I can get you a kind of try on session at Sephora because honey, honey, I don't have Pat McGrath money. Honey, I don't have Pat McGrath money. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I know there's like a million podcasts out there and you chose to listen to this one. And I hope you found some value in this podcast. Don't forget to look at the show notes where I will be referencing the book that I spoke of in the podcast and linking some low cost psychotherapy options. And again, if you found any value in this podcast, please feel free to subscribe, share the podcast or tell a friend about it. I want to give a, a special shout out to Via Moore, who personally called me and told me that this pod, my previous podcast helped her. And I was like, yes, <laughs> rate and review the podcast, sign up to my email list. And of course, always feel free to go to my website, www.martika.com for more information. So in talking of codependency, I thought about what are some of the issues that relationships face when they have the added responsibility of parenthood. And that's what I want to talk about on the next Love and Makeup. <laughs>